and welcome to 100 Things Pittsburgh. On this show, we'll be talking to some local experts about hidden gems throughout our city. And we're kicking off today with David Schofield. He's the director of Meadowcroft Rock Shelter in Avella. Uh, Meadowcroft is featured in my new book, 100 Things to Do in Pittsburgh Before You Die. It's a Pittsburgh bucket list. And Meadowcroft is one of my favorite hidden gems in Pittsburgh. So we'll tell you a little bit about it and why you should make the drive out there. Awesome. I appreciate being invited. Thanks. So let's start off by talking about what is Meadowcroft for people who've never heard of it or maybe have never been. Yeah. Well, Meadowcroft is an outdoor museum. We're located in Washington County, uh, outside the town of Avella, which is about 35 miles from downtown Pittsburgh. And we're part of the Heinz History Center Museum System, along with the, the History Center and our sister site, the Fort Pitt Museum. Excellent. And what makes Meadowcroft so special? What happened there? Well, our, uh, what most people know about Meadowcroft is the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. And it is a National Historic Landmark and an archaeological site that has provided evidence of people camping at that site 19,000 years ago. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this is the oldest site of human habitation in North America, right? It is, yeah. Yeah, okay. we know that um, people used the site as early as 19,000 years ago and continue to use it all the way through um, when the Western Pennsylvania frontier uh, was being settled in the 18th century. Hmm. And even into the 1970s when local kids were partying at the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter because it makes a great place to hang out. Hmm. Okay, so Pittsburgh was a most livable city even 16,000 years ago, I suppose. It, it <laughs> was, and you know, it's, it's amazing to think, and most people don't realize, that almost 19,000 years prior to Christopher Columbus being born, people were right here in Western Pennsylvania. Hmm. So what made Meadowcroft the site there? What made it so attractive for people who were passing through? Yeah, it's uh, an overhanging rock ledge, a naturally formed sandstone overhang that provides a sheltered place to camp. And it's high enough above the creek so that it doesn't flood um, in the spring when waters are running high. Um, it protects people from the weather. The, the rocks absorb the sunlight uh, during the day and then radiate that heat back out at night. So it makes it a little bit warmer there at night than it would be otherwise. Um, and it's just, uh, there's fresh water available nearby and food resources. So it was essentially the ideal campsite. Awesome. So what kind of food would people have been eating back in, in that time? Do we know? Yeah, there's a lot of evidence of food uh, from the rock shelter. In fact, there's uh, 956,000 animal remains and 1.4 million plant remains that were excavated from Meadowcroft. And uh, among those are uh, some things that are residual from their meals. And that included uh, the, the typical game animal suspects you would think of, white-tailed deer, rabbits, uh, turkey, um, animals the size of elk. Uh, there were actually elk uh, here at one point. And um, then lots of smaller things like freshwater mussels, and then the plant resources, berries, nuts, um, all manner of, uh, of natural food. Wow. So what was the process to finding all of that, uh, that research and collecting all of that evidence? How did that kick off, and what did that process look like? Well, the site was discovered in 1955 by uh, a local farmer and property owner by the name of Albert Miller. Um, the Miller family had owned that property since 1795. Hmm. And Albert and his younger brother, Delvin, who most people know as the harness racing uh, icon, the one who started the Meadows Racetrack, um, the two of them uh, grew up on the family farm there. And Albert was the historian of the two brothers and um, amateur archeologist. Mm -hmm. And he decided that uh, his rock shelter was probably used by native people. Uh, he was very well read, knew what rock shelters were, and um, on November 12th, 1955, he was walking through the site and found a freshly dug groundhog hole. And so he 
sifted through what the groundhog had excavated and found some artifacts. And so he knew he was right, and he knew he should keep quiet about it so the site doesn't get looted and destroyed. And uh, he went home, got a shovel and a screen, and enlarged the hole to see what else he could come across. And he found some other artifacts, some burnt bones, some flint flakes, and eventually encountered an intact flint knife. So he knew he was right, and he was wise enough to know he should keep quiet about it. So he spent 18 years trying to find a professional archaeologist to excavate. And so in 1973, uh, a new faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. James Adivasio, uh, was looking for a field school location, heard about the rock shelter, and asked for permission to dig there. So he did in the summer of 1973. And it wasn't too far into that first season that they realized this site is older uh, than we anticipated. Wow, that's amazing. So mm -hmm. why did it take so long to find a researcher? Was he looking for just the perfect fit of a person? Or you know, what, what took so long to find the right person? Well, for one reason or another, archaeologists either had other work they were doing, other sites they were involved in, or it didn't fit what they were looking for. Dr. Adivasio's expertise was in caves and rock shelters. Mm -hmm. So that's the type of site he was looking for. I suppose when you think about the full history, you know, a few years is nothing in comparison to 16,000. Right. So finding right. the right person makes a lot of sense. Right, right. And I should make a distinction. Uh, we have for many years talked about 16,000 years at the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter. That's actually radiocarbon years, mm -hmm. which doesn't match exactly with calendar years. And so we've just started changing what we refer to the site as in, in terms of its age to 19,000 years. Because when you convert the 16,000 radiocarbon years to calendar years, you get 19,000. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Huh. So you mentioned the flint knife. What were some other um, things that were discovered that proved Meadowcroft's age? Yeah, well, there were a number of um, stone points, what are called lithics, um, either stone knives or projectile points. And the Miller Point, named after Albert Miller, uh, is one of the more significant objects because that dates to uh, about 14,000 years ago. Uh, so at the end of the last ice age, you know, that was being used as a, a projectile point, a spear point, for people that were camping at the rock shelter. And it was left behind, either intentionally discarded or they lost it. But it remained at the site until it was uncovered in 1976. So there are the stone, bo stone tools, there are bone tools, um, there are basketry fragments. So 20,000 artifacts in all, and then as I mentioned earlier, a wealth of uh, animal remains and plant remains, not all of which has been studied yet. Wow. So when people visit the site, what exactly can they see? Of course, they can see the rock shelter. Can they also see some of the artifacts? Are those on display? Uh, we don't have those on display now, but we have plans to do that. Uh, we're currently uh, securing that collection. It was not um, stored by us previously. Dr. Adivasio had that collection when he was um, uh, at Mercyhurst University. And so we're getting that back, and uh, we're making plans to display some of those artifacts as we expand our visitor center in the, the coming couple of years. Now, when I was there, I was able to take a tour. Does that happen, do those happen daily, or do people need to sign up? No, um, any day that we're open, you can visit the rock shelter. And uh, we built a new facility over the excavation, uh, opened it to the public in 2008, so it's just been uh, 11 years now. But that uh, structure has allowed us to give tours of the site and for visitors to see everything, that even things that weren't visible previously. You stand on a observation platform which is cantilevered over the excavation. So you're actually looking right into the excavated area. And uh, there's an audio visual program and a staff member on site to also talk to you and answer questions that you might have. Excellent. So who's, who's a good age to visit Meadowcroft? Is this something that appeals to all ages or maybe just for adults or just for kids? Well, it does appeal to all ages because it, not only do we have the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter as our crown jewel, uh, but we have other outdoor areas as well. We have a recreated 16th century Monongahela Indian village. We recreated an 18th century frontier trading post. And we have a 19th century recreated village area with a one room schoolhouse and a blacksmith shop uh, and a covered bridge. So 
there's something for everybody. And uh, we really encourage uh, families uh, because they can have a, a good time in the same place at the same time. And uh, lots of, we get lots of grandchildren with their grandparents, mm. um, parents with their young children, and uh, just individuals that come and want to see what Meadow Cross is all about. Yeah, I remember from my visit, um, I really enjoyed the Monongahela area mm. and learning about farming. We learned a lot about the Three Sisters crops. Right is really interesting. Um, and then sometimes there is actually a blacksmith there, right? Yeah, and always we always have a blacksmith at work in the 19th century village. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember that as well. That was something you don't get to see just about anywhere. So right. it makes, makes Meadowcroft very special. Right, and, and kids and adults enjoy watching the fire and mm -hmm. the hot iron being worked at the end. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it's art, really. Yeah. And then I also remember learning about um, trading. Can you talk a little bit mm -hmm. about how this area was really important as a sort of a trading post? And I think specifically I learned about um, furs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that really gets back to the point that we're, we're trying to tell a story of 19,000 years of a human presence really on that piece of real estate. Mm -hmm. And so we tell the story of the hunter-gatherers at the rock shelter as well as the scientific study of the site. Um, the Monongahela Indian Village tells the story of how agriculture was developed and, and the importance of that in allowing people to stay in one place year round instead of having to follow the food across the landscape. Uh, but then in the 18th century, the big idea is that Europeans arrived. Mm -hmm. And so there was this, um, the, the uh, commercial revolution of the fur trade. And um, so we tell that story and how uh, it benefited both cultures uh, to, um, uh, to come together through commerce. So the Europeans were, were partnering with the Indians that were living here to get furs to ship back to England. And the uh, Indians were getting uh, objects that they hadn't previously had, iron and, and steel tools and um, uh, brass kettles and um, um, other types of trade goods that mm were really improving their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And so it was of mutual benefit to both cultures. Yeah, and it's amazing to see that history up close. I mm -hmm. mean, certainly we've read about this, all of us have read about this in textbooks, I'm sure, but to actually witness that and to see people talk about it firsthand is, uh, is really amazing. I think that's what makes Meadowcroft really special. Yeah, and we, uh, you know, we talk mostly about the, the commerce uh, aspect of it. Certainly there was, there was violence and mm -hmm. warfare. Mm -hmm. Um, our sister site, the Fort Pitt Museum, deals more with the frontier and, and uh, the military aspect of it. But we, we talk about the commerce and, and the partnerships that were formed and how it was beneficial. There was cultural borrowing taking place. Um, so it was an interesting time. For sure. So another interesting thing I remember learning about was the atlatl. Mm. So for anyone who hasn't heard about this, would you mind explaining what an atlatl is? Yeah, the atlatl is a prehistoric hunting weapon. It's the precursor to the bow and arrow. So uh, the atlatl was a weapon of choice for thousands and thousands of years prior to the invention of the bow and arrow, uh, which we don't find um, any, um, any evidence of bows and arrows in our part of the world until the last couple thousand years. And uh, so there was a long period of time where the atlatl was the weapon. And what it is is simply a stick that launches a long dart. Uh, these darts can be, you know, six, eight feet long. They're tipped with a stone point, a projectile point. And because it's a, a launching stick, it essentially adds another articulated joint to your arm. Mm. So you can throw it with more force and velocity than you could without the stick. And so in the hands of somebody who grew up using one of those, uh, it's, a, it's a lethal weapon. And we have now for 22 years had an annual atlatl competition. We just had it uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we have some of the best throwers in the world uh, attend our event. And they're impressive to watch as they hit the bullseye with <laughs> wow. their dart. Well, it's not easy. No, it's <laughs> not. No, it takes a lot of practice. Yeah. Now, do I remember that there was an atlatl at Meadowcroft that you could try? Yeah, to any day that a visitor comes to Meadowcroft, in our Indian village, we have an area set up. We have a three-dimensional elk target that you can uh, see 
how good you are. <laughs> yeah, I tried my hand at it, and I'm not very good. So I'm just <laughs> glad I live in this century, yeah. <laughs> not back then. <laughs> yeah, it's mm. wonderful. And it's, uh, you know, not only are you learning things, but that's something really hands-on that you're getting to experience firsthand. Yeah, we do emphasize a hands-on approach to learning at Meadowcroft. People are going to remember things a lot better when they've actually tried it for themselves, rather than just seeing someone do it or just reading about it. Uh, it's an experience you don't forget. Yeah, certainly. So what are some other special events you have coming up? I know, there is there a baseball competition? There is. Coming up on August 17th, we have our vintage baseball event. So we have two teams uh, that play according to the 1860s rules, and they wear period-appropriate uh, uniforms. Um, the Somerset Frosty Sons of Thunder <laughs> and the <laughs> Addison <laughs> Mountain Stars uh, uh -huh. will play uh, generally a doubleheader uh, is what they do. And so visitors can come and watch baseball as it was played in the 19th century. And it's a lot of fun. Um, prior to that, actually coming up this weekend, is our um, event, a new event, um, where we're talking about the Cliftonville Mine Riot, mm -hmm. which is a, um, a little known uh, event that took place in 1922, just a few miles from Meadowcroft, where there was a, a mining strike, a long-lasting mine strike uh, that erupted in violence. And as many as 13 people were killed, including the sheriff uh, from Brook County, West Virginia. So we'll be looking at that event and uh, sharing the details of that. On the 20th and 21st of this month, uh, we have uh, Range Resources has sponsored a free weekend, mm. so visitors can come to Meadowcroft for free that weekend. And uh, we also have s three more um, appearances by Dr. James Adebasio, the archaeologist who's done all the work at Meadowcroft since 1973. So uh, the next one is in September, and then we do one in October and one in November. Um, and uh, your viewers can look at our website for the details mm -hmm. on those events. Excellent. Now, the event with Dr. Adivisio, is that um, a lecture or a tour? What, what exactly it's does both. he do? It's okay. um, He provides a lecture first mm -hmm. uh, and really uh, talks about not only Meadowcroft, but the whole pursuit of learning who these first Americans were um, and other archaeological sites that have contributed to that knowledge. And then following the lecture, we go down to the site and he leads the tour there. So if we haven't convinced you to visit yet, uh, I guess I'll just ask, kind of wrapping up, why is it worth making the drive to Avella? Why should folks uh, head out to Meadowcroft this summer? Well, there's lots of reasons. Uh, but I'll say that um, Meadowcroft is a unique destination. Um, you know, the fact that the Meadowcroft Rock Shelter has been used by people for 19,000 years, and you can stand in the same spot that people stood during the last ice age and see evidence. You can see evidence of campfires uh, that still remain in the excavation. Uh, it, it's really an amazing feeling to, to stand there and know how long people have been using that spot. So that would be my number one mm -hmm. reason. But we also I just have a great place. It's out in the country. Uh, you can uh, kind of unplug and come out and enjoy uh, some time out in the country learning and having fun. Absolutely. And for folks who are interested, what is your website that they can check out? We are part of the Heinz History Center. So if you go to HeinzHistoryCenter.org, there is the Meadowcroft section of the website and all of our events and other information and pictures, uh, all that you need is right there. Excellent. And you can also learn about Meadowcroft Rock Shelter and Historic Village in my book, 100 Things to Do in Pittsburgh Before You Die. If you are interested in learning more, visit 100thingspittsburgh.com. That's the number, 100thingspittsburgh.com. And I would like to thank you so much for joining us uh, for this edition of 100 Things Pittsburgh. Anything else that you would like to share? No, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about Meadowcroft and encourage your viewers to come visit us for themselves. Yes, likewise. Well, thank you so much, and we'll see you back here for another edition of 100 Things Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm.